Now, if you'll take your Bible and turn to Revelation 2. Revelation 2. Uh, someone said last week that since we're doing letters, at some point in the series, I need to sing the Blues Clues song. Um, I declined to do that, okay? We're not, we're not going to do that today, but we are studying these seven letters to churches. Uh, these are seven literal churches in seven literal cities, and these churches represent symbolically problems the church, church has faced throughout its history and will continue to face until Jesus returns. Today we're going to look at the church in Ephesus, and this church is facing an interesting problem. The problem this church is facing is that delight has become duty, and they've drifted into danger. Now, the, the way Revelation 2 says that is that they have lost their first love. Delight became duty. Now, you, you get what that's like. A delight becomes a duty. A get-to becomes a have-to. Uh, your, your heart starts with this burning passion for something, and then over time it grows cold. Um, I, was, uh, I, I was around a, a high school athlete one time, just probably one of the most athletic guys I've ever been around. It was his senior year. He was a star football player, and I said, man, how, how's football going this year? He said, I hate it. Now, when he was a seventh grader, loved it, like he you know, ate, drank, and slept football, just loved the game, and by the time he was a senior, just hated it. Like a delight had become a duty, and then he had drifted into the danger of not loving the game. Now, that is a minor kind of danger, right? It's not, it's not going to be a big deal if you don't love football after high school. But the principle and path is the same. We see this in Revelation 2 where delight becomes a duty and you drift into danger. Now we see that in the church at Ephesus. They move from delight to duty. And if it can happen in the church at Ephesus, it can happen in the church at Exodus. And we need to pay attention because the result of this, the, the danger that is highlighted because of this is haunting. The danger that Jesus holds up to them is chilling in this passage. And so my hope is that we would hear Jesus' warning and do what Jesus says today. So I'm going to read chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, pray, and then we'll jump into God's word. Look at verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you. And remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we have uh, this letter, Jesus, that you uh, sent to this church in Ephesus. Thank you that John wrote this down. Thank you that it has been preserved over the centuries so that we can study it here today. Thank you that uh, your word is true, that it is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and for training in righteousness so that we may be adequate and equipped for every good work. And so, Lord, would you, would you help us today to understand your word? Get, give us what verse 7 says. Give us ears that hear. Help us, Lord. Give us eyes that see. And Lord, give us hearts that are receptive to your word. And, and, and not just receptive, but that respond in what your word calls us to do. Lord, would you work in our hearts today? Um, capture our attention through your word and change the course of our life through your word because of our time today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So here's our big idea for today. That when delight becomes duty, you drift into danger. When delight becomes duty, 
you drift into danger. Let's do some uh, introductory work first. So Jesus writes this letter to the church at Ephesus. Let's talk about Ephesus for a moment. Ephesus was a major city of this day. It was a port city known for pleasure and power. So you might think of a place like New Orleans or Miami. Okay, um, it, the uh, temple to Artemis was there. So one of the great wonders of the ancient world was central to their community identity. Uh, Artemis was known by Artemis or Diana. She was the goddess of hunting and fertility. So she was very close to provision. In fact, there was a bank in the temple. So all the concerns around provision for their lives was connected to her. The worship of Artemis was quite sensual, a lot of temple prostitutes and priestesses, and so she was also connected to pleasure. She was also a local economic engine. The temple was a local economic engine for the city, so she was connected to power. Ephesus was a center of Roman government, so you had this center of worship and the center of government all colliding in this one city. A lot of magic and occult influence in Ephesus, and it was a major city at the time this was written. There's a church there. This letter is written to the church in Ephesus. Just like it's an influential city, this was an influential church, there's a reason it's written first. It's first in this list of seven because the church at Ephesus was the most influential church in the region we know as Turkey. We see the beginning of this church in Acts 19. Paul comes to the city. There's already, already 12 uh, disciples there. He spends two years with them. The gospel just takes off and starts saving people in radical ways. They start uh, confessing sin. Uh, they bring all of their magic and occult wares and, and burn them in the middle of the city. Uh, in Acts 19, we see that this costs like 50,000 pieces of silver, which in today's money would be north of $6 million dollars. And so can you imagine the gospel moving in a community in such a way that people would bring $6 million of sinful stuff to burn in the middle of the city? That's what's going on at Ephesus. And throughout the Bible, there's a lot of, in, of, of uh, investment in this church. Paul writes the letter we know as Ephesians to this church. Uh, Paul uh, sends Timothy to Ephesus to, to lead and, and to care for that church. While he's there, he writes first and second Timothy. Uh, John writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John to the churches in the uh, region of Ephesus, probably the seven churches that are also in Revelation. And so a lot of investment has been made in this church. And now 40 years after Acts 19, so 40 years after the church is planted, they get a letter from Jesus. And it says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. So Jesus is telling John who to write this to. He writes to the angel. Last week I said that scholars say that this angel refers to the pastor of these churches. Men appointed by God to shepherd and lead and guard the people that are entrusted to them. People who will be accountable to God for how they do that. So to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. Then notice how Jesus identifies himself. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, each letter, Jesus identifies himself uh, that, that uh, connects back to Revelation 1. And here, Jesus identifies himself as the one who holds the stars. Now, in Revelation 1, those stars are the angels or pastors of the churches, and his right hand is a hand of power. So he's the one who holds the pastors of the churches in his hand. And when it says that he walks in the midst of the lampstands, he's walking in the midst of the churches saying that I'm there, I'm present, I'm with you. And so Jesus signifies himself as the one who's sustaining these churches. And he's writing to warn them because their delight has become duty. That's point number one. Their delight has become duty, and we see that in verse 2. Jesus says, I know some things. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently, bearing up for my namesake, and you have not grown 
weary. I love that Jesus knows this about these people. Sometimes it can feel like Jesus, uh, like we can be going through all kinds of things in our lives and it feels like Jesus forgets. It feels like Jesus doesn't know. It feels like we're all alone in the world. And Jesus says to this church, I know. I know. He says, I know your works. That's the energy and effort you put towards serving him. I know your toil. That's the trouble you experience serving him. I know your patient endurance. This is the idea of your perseverance, your suffering. Jesus says, I know. He knows not only what they're doing, but he knows how they interact with others. He says, I know how you cannot bear with those who are evil. Keep in mind, Ephesus was in the center of the worship of Artemis. And so all around them, everything in the cultural air they were breathing was pointing them to worship a false god that would promise provision, power, and pleasure. And, and Jesus says, I know that you cannot bear with those who are evil. You cannot bear. In other words, you don't go along with that. Jesus says. And then he says, you've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be false. So not only uh, are they, uh, do they have eyes open to what the world's doing, they have eyes open to what these false apostles are doing, teaching them false things. If you remember our study in 1 John, first, uh, John wrote 1 John because there were these false apostles going around to these churches teaching false things. Well, here Jesus says, you've uh, faced them, You've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be false. And so they've, they've got their eyes open to not only what the world's telling them, but what false, false teachers are telling them, and they're not being led astray. Specifically in verse 6, he mentions the Nicolaitans. It says, yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, lots has been written about who these Nicolaitans are. The Bible's not incredibly clear about them, except that Jesus hates what they do, and that should be enough. And the church in Ephesus also hates what they do, which is an important thing for us to remember. You can hate what someone does and love that person. We, we, live, in a culture, we live in a culture where that statement is railed against. But Jesus hates the works of the Nicolaitans, but he died for some of the he died for the, the Nicolaitans who would trust him. And so we can hate what someone does and love them, because Jesus does that for us. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and yet God so loved us that he sent Jesus to die for us. And so Jesus writes this letter at these people. They've heard false things, they've, they've uh, tested these apostles, and they found them to be. False. All that to say, oh, verse 3, Jesus knows again. He says, I know you're enduring patiently. You're bearing up for my name's sake. You've not grown weary. So listen to this church. It's, not, it's a great church, okay? They, they, they serve Jesus faithfully. They're doctrinally sound, and they're enduring suffering. Does that not sound like a great church to be a part of? Verse 4. I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. This church that is serving Jesus faithfully, doctrinally sound, uh, resisting the world, resisting false teachers, suffering faithfully, this church has lost, has abandoned, it says, the love you had at first. That word abandon means to dismiss, omit, or depart from. The, the word is in the aorist tense in Greek, which symbolizes like a completed action with a continuing result. So something happened in the history of the church where the church abandoned their first love, and there's been this ongoing, continuing result of it. Now, we don't know what happened. We don't know what they're responding to. It could be some pain. It could be sin done to them. It could be sin done by them. But something has happened to where they would abandon their first love and there would be ongoing result from that. Delight became duty. They once had hearts that burned with love for God. Now they simply have hard work serving him, doctrinal fidelity, and patiently enduring suffering. 
but they don't have love anymore. And Jesus comes to a church like that with a warning. This I have against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. Now, lots has been written on what this first love is. Uh, there's a few options, probably more, but the few I want to highlight. One could be their love for God. You know, if you read Acts 19, man, the gospel just radically does amazing things in that city. People are repenting of sin in, in really sacrificial ways, and God's at work in their hearts. First John's written to this church where it says, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, and this call for us to love him in return. So it could be that the church has left its, its love for God. Jesus said this is the first and greatest commandment, that you love the Lord your God. And so perhaps they've left their love for God. Another option is they've left their love for the gospel. Not just love for God, but his, his gospel, this gospel message, this announcement of news that this God who loved us sent his one and only son to die for us so that we could belong to him. You and I who lived in rebellion, who were dead in our trespasses and sins, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the, diso in the sons of disobedience, we all of us, all of us, were running from God, and yet God loved us and sent his son to bring us back. It could be that they've forgotten the good news of the gospel. If the letter of Ephesians is filled with the gospel to remind them. So maybe that was their first love that they've lost, that they've abandoned, a love for the gospel. Another option is not that they've abandoned their love for God and not that they've abandoned their love for the gospel, but that they've abandoned their love for people who are far from God. They've abandoned their zeal for the mission. They've been so focused on external factors like suffering and false teaching uh, and the culture war, that they've lost the idea that there are people around them who don't know Jesus. And they've lost their first love of people meeting Jesus. Now certainly all that's connected. If, you, if your love for God wanes and your love for the gospel wanes, your zeal for evangelism and mission is going to wane. You know, think about it. You find that restaurant, that new restaurant you love, and you're telling everybody you know about it, and everybody's got to go, and you're, you're bringing, like, busloads of people there to eat with you, right? And then you go, and it kind of just kind of gets to be normal, and you don't talk about it anymore. That can happen with our relationship with God, too. When our hearts get cold toward God and his gospel, our passion for mission will wane. I got to teach the theology class on Monday night. I told uh, Pastor Tyler in the summer, I said, uh, man, I would love to get to teach one of the classes. He said, great. I said, just assign me whatever. So he assigned me final judgment and hell. <laughs> I said, thanks, man. Appreciate you. Somebody else got heaven, like all the fun stuff at the end of the book, and I get hell, you know? And so in my prep, and, and it was good for my soul. It was really good for my soul to remember that all of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And that there are people who will stand there with no hope at all. And that there are people who are going to hell to experience eternal conscious punishment from God for their sin. It was a good reminder. And as I was preparing, I came across this quote from Charles Spurgeon, and it's going to be on the screen. He says this, Oh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay and not, not madly to destroy themselves. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let not one go there unwarned or unprayed for. That's a heart that has not lost its first love for people. That's a, that's a heart that is on fire with delight in God and his word and his mission. In September, I asked us to be praying that the Lord would give us an opportunity to share the gospel with someone. I wonder, I wonder, is God, is God giving us any opportunities? Have there, been, have there been opportunities that the Lord's provided? I would really love for us to make it hard to get to hell from Gaston County. 
I really would love for that to be true. And if we lose our first love, our hearts will not burn like that. We won't be holding people by the knees. We won't be saying, you'll only go to hell over my dead body. Like you, we, we won't be speaking like that if, our, if we lose our first love of mission. And you see this in mission. You lose your first, first love. Delight becomes duty. You see this in marriage too, right? You know, you lose your first love for one another. What started as a, I want to spend my life with you covenant becomes an I can't stand you conflict, you know? And just, you just lose, you lose your delight in one another. Delight can become duty. You can move from time together and, 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 and loving each other and, and spending time with each other and all that. You can move from, from all those things to bills and ball games. And you become a bank and an Uber driver instead of a couple that loves each other. You spend more time shoulder to shoulder or back to back than face to face. And when delight in one another becomes duty to one another, danger is close. I'm going to say that again. When delight in one another becomes duty to one another, danger is close. So we need to foster delight in one another. You need to remember why you liked each other. To do that, you probably need to spend time together. You need to leave those children that you love more than you can explain and remember that they are not the primary relationship in your life. Your relationship with God is primary. Your relationship with your spouse is the second one. And kids are third. So often, kids can kind of get in the wrong order of that thing. Sometimes they get first. That's another problem for another day. Here, if they get in the front of your marriage, that's a real problem. Like the most important thing you can do for your kids is have a heart on fire for the Lord. The second thing you can do is have a good marriage. And so when was the last time you got time away and just enjoyed each other? Maybe, maybe an afternoon, maybe a couple of days, maybe several. They'll live. They really will. They'll be alive when you get back. I've talked, to, I've talked to married couples far too many times who never went away with their kids. And then their kids go away to college and, and, and other things, and they're like, I don't know this person. We used to be close. Now we're roommates and, and business partners. And so when delight becomes duty, you're getting really close to danger. That happens in mission. That happens in marriage. It happened here in Ephesus. They lost their first love, either love for God, love for his gospel, love for the mission. And here's the deal. They were still serving. They were still doctrinally sound. They were still suffering well, but they lost their first love. Duty became delight, became duty. And when delight becomes duty, that leads to the second point. Duty leads to danger. We see that in verse 5. Look at verse 5. It says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, the danger that comes when delight becomes duty, the danger in this passage is that Jesus will come and remove their lampstand from its place. Now, what does that mean? Well, the lampstand in the Bible was a symbol of God's presence with his people. It was a symbol of the church's witness in the world, God's people's witness in the world. One person said it this way, the lampstand was what made the church beautiful. The presence of God among his people. That's what made the church beautiful. What makes the church beautiful is not buildings and budgets and groups and activities. What makes the church beautiful is the presence of Jesus with his people. And Jesus says, I'm going to come, and if you don't repent, I'm going to take that away. You lose your love, you lose your lamp, Jesus says. That is chilling. Jesus says to this church, I'm going to take away what makes the church beautiful. Because Jesus would rather take away that lamp 
and close a church of cold hearts than let the world think that cold hearts are what the gospel creates. So he says, I'm going to, you lose your love, you're going to lose your lamp. And this is a big deal. <laughs> you're like, well, okay, so a church closed. I mean, I've seen that. That's happened before. There was not another church in the city. So if this gets taken away, the gospel witness for this city and the influence over the region is gone. Because these people sacrifice delight for duty. And that led to danger. You lose your love, you lose your lamp. Unless you repent. Which means they have to make a decision. Point number three. We're almost done. They have to make a decision. He says, if not, I will come to you, remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Now, what repentance looks like is the beginning of verse 5. He says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Remember means call to mind, recollect, be mindful of. Where you were somewhere, you fell from that place. So remember where you fell from. Remember, remember back when your heart burned with a desire for Jesus. Remember when your heart was on fire for the gospel. Remember when people couldn't shut you up from sharing your faith. Remember, he says, remember from where you have fallen. Repent. Now, this word repent means a change of mind that leads to a change of action. So you're going one direction toward cold duty and cold doctrinal fidelity that has no heart in it. You're going this direction. You change your mind about that, and you change your action to move toward your first love again. So remember where you came from. Remember where you fell from. Change your mind and your heart and your action. Repent of this cold duty and this cold doctrinal faithfulness with no heart in it. Change. And then he says to recommit to the works you did at first. Verse 5. And do the works you did at first. You got first love and you got first works. And he said, like, look, remember. Like, remember what you did. Remember, man, remember how your heart used to burn with fire of desire and delight and love? Remember what you did in response to that? That's the decision they have to make. He says, if you don't do that, I'm coming, I'm going to take the lampstand. So repent. Remember, repent, and recommit to the works that I've called you to do. Now, as, as we read over this, Exodus, like we, we share some commonalities with this church in Ephesus. We, we've got a pretty good grasp on doctrine. I mean, we can all always be growing, but we've got a pretty solid grasp there. We're a church that cares about confronting evil things that are false. If you come in here and you start teaching whack stuff, we're going to be nice to you and correct you. We aren't going to stop serving, not because we're duty-bound, but because we're duty-driven. We feel like the mission of Jesus matters, and so we're, we're not going to stop serving and because of those things, we share a common danger. The flame of delight in the Lord, his gospel, and his mission could grow cold. You get so focused on doing and doctrinal fidelity, and, and, and so, oh, we can get so focused on all that stuff that our hearts get cold. We drift from delight to duty. And when our when our delight in God becomes a cold duty for God, danger is really close. And so we've got to fight the drift. We've got to fight the drift from delight to duty. We've got to remember, repent, and recommit our, to our first works that flowed out of our first love. Otherwise, we could share this warning. I don't even want to think about verse 5 happening here. That Jesus would remove what makes this church beautiful. And it's not any of us, and it's not this building, it's not, it's not budget, it's not, it's not any of those things. What makes this church beautiful is that Jesus is with us. And the idea that because our love grows cold, Jesus would take that away. And that is haunting. And so... How do we apply this? Well, 
I just would say this, Exodus, let's overcome. Let's overcome. That was supposed to have an apostrophe in it, but apparently the font won't do apostrophes, so it says let us. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be like formal. I'm just saying let's. Let's overcome, okay? We get this word, we get this word from uh, verse 7. It says, he who has an ear to hear. Now, verse 7 shows up in all seven letters, okay? He who has an ear to hear, excuse me, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers. That word conquers means overcome. To the one who overcomes, to the one who conquers. I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, we see that in Revelation 21 and 22, in the new heaven and new earth, we see God's people enjoying the tree of life. We see God's people enjoying the paradise of God. And what we see here is that to the one who overcomes, to the one who conquers, there's a promise. There's a promise that we will get to eat of the tree of life. We will get to be in the paradise of God. And to get that promise at the end of verse 7, we have to do what's in the middle of verse 7. We have to conquer. Now, real clear, we don't conquer to earn that tree of life. We don't conquer to merit that eternal life. But our conquering is a condition of enjoying the tree of life and the paradise of God. You don't conquer, you don't get that. Now, here's the good news. Jesus, Romans 8 says, has made us more than conquerors. And so even this call to conquer is a call for us to depend on him and his grace to make us that so that we can enjoy what he has for us. But that should also remind us of the need for us to continue moving forward with hearts that are ablaze with his love. Love for God, a love for his gospel, a love for his people. For us to continue moving forward with hearts that are on fire to serve him in the world so that we can enjoy this tree of life and the paradise of God. The church at Ephesus had to overcome. The church at Exodus must overcome too. So what do we have to overcome in this letter? What's the danger that we have to overcome? The danger is the drift toward duty. The danger is that we would get so focused on our works and our doctrine and, our, and, and all the things we're doing that we would lose our love for God, that we would lose our love for his gospel, that we would lose our, our love for people who are far from him, that, we would, that our hearts would grow cold in the midst of just a cold duty. So we have to fight the drift. We have to, we have to fight this drift from our first love to away from it. We have to fight that drift so that we can overcome. And if we're to do that, then we've got to remember. And we've got to remember what it was like to be saved. You know, Some of us have been Christians for a long time. We can forget what it was like to not know the Lord. Some of you, you're brand new Christians, you're like, no, I know. Like, I know the kind of hopelessness I was facing. For some of us, man, we need to remember that we were far from God with no hope in the world. But God loved us and sent his son to die for us. We need to remember where we've fallen from. We need to repent. We need to repent of just making Christianity simply about duty and have to. And, and return to this delight that it's get to. And I, we get to be his. We get to serve him. We get to know him. And then we need to recommit to the works that we did at first. First love drives first works. And the way we get there is we bring our hearts that have grown cold to the one who can make them fire again. One of my favorite Old Testament passages that reference Jesus is in Isaiah 42, um, where the writer tells us about the suffering servant, and it says, a bruised reed he will not break. Maybe you've been walking through like a, um, a marsh or an area that has reeds in it, and you, you bump one, and they'll just fall over because they're really tender. And the picture there is the bruised, bruised reed. He's not going to break it off and throw it away. He's going he's gonna to mend it. Then it says, a smoldering wick he will not extinguish. You know, you think about your heart that once burned brightly for the Lord. 
just full of passion and hope and love and excitement for him. And now it's like a little smoldering candle that's just about out. And it would be easy for him to go and just put it out. But that's not what he does. He doesn't extinguish it. He flames it to fire. So if you bring, you bring your heart to him, you bring your heart to him, you say, Jesus, my, my heart used to burn with love for you. Would you it's, kind of, it's kind of waning. Would you fan it to flame again? He's not going to push you away. He's going to say, yep, let's do this. We return. We return to our first love. And he fills us again. Now, some of you, you've never come to Jesus before at all. You've, your heart is far from him. You've never trusted him as your Lord and Savior. You never surrendered your life to him. Today would be a great day to do that. Today would be a great day to do that. And you might go, man, it sounds like all y'all kind of really struggle. You have no idea. But Jesus is with us. And his grace is sufficient for us. And he's going to see us safely home. And so on that day... We may be standing there all struggle bus, but we'll be standing there with an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he can be your advocate too, if you'll trust him. Because you're going to stand before him one day. Either he'll be your advocate or he'll be against you. And so trust him today. Trust him. Bring your heart to him and trust him as Savior and Lord. And then as a people... This letter is not written to individual, an, an individual. It's written to a group, a church. Can we together commit by God's grace to remember, to repent, and to recommit to the works we did at first? Can we, can we commit together to do that? Because the idea of Jesus taking away what makes us beautiful is terrifying. It's terrifying. Let's do what we're called to do here so that in the new heaven and new earth we can enjoy that tree of life, whatever that means, and the paradise of God together. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your love for us. We're so grateful for your kindness to us. You've been so very good. You loved us when we did not love you back. You loved us when we were in rebellion against you. You loved us more than we can express. And so, Lord, I pray that you would capture our hearts with the beauty of your love for us and the greatness of your grace toward us. I pray that our hearts would burn with delight in you. And and yes, that we would be solid doctrinally, that we would serve you faithfully, that we would endure suffering well, that we would do all those things, but that all of that would come from a heart that is so deeply in love with you, so deeply devoted to you, so deeply delighting in you that those works would come out of first love. Lord, would you do that in us individually and in us as a church for your glory and our good. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.